my dash. <laughs> okay, hi everyone, welcome. So welcome to this Heroines Book Month event. My name is Emily Hipsley Davidson. I'm the event production intern for Heroines and I'm joined tonight by Lee Kaufman to discuss her recommended book, Lucy Greeley's memoir, Autobiography of a Face. So thank you for joining us today, Lee. Uh, thank you for having me. <laughs> thank you, that's great. Now, before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm hosting this meeting from the lands of the Wongo people. I would also like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay respect to elders past, present and emerging and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders people here today. So housekeeping, if you'd like to ask a question, you have several ways of doing that. You can either turn your microphone off mute and ask your question. You can also ask questions in the chat or use the raise hand function to get our attention. So as we are discussing a recommended book today, we're happy to include comments as well as questions. So I'll kick right off. So Lee, what uh, drew you to this book? What interests you about Autobiography of a Face? Sure. Thank you for the introduction, Amy. I just quickly yeah. want to say that hello to Dash, who I can see in the join us, who I know and have Pearl. I don't know you yet, but I'll probably get to know you <laughs> in the baseball forum. <laughs> So um, I've actually heard about Autobiography of a Face, here it is, a uh, long, long time ago, <laughs> because I've been um, interested in the memoir genre way before I even started writing in this genre. And um, in the 1990s, it was a time, the time of uh, a huge boom in memoirs. It was really sort of the time when the genre of creative nonfiction of which memoir is a subgenre, became uh, became more sort of widely recognized and popped into, uh, you know, headlines, even news headlines sometimes. And um, lots and lots of memoirs came at that time, but not many of them are remembered today. But Autobiography of a Face by Lucy Greeley was one of those classics, but sort of uh, really, uh, if I think about the 90s, I'm thinking about memoirs such as Vivian Gornick's uh, Fierce Attachments, for example, um, or Catherine Harrison's Kiss, and I would say that Autobiography of a Face would be up there. Now, at the time when I heard about this book, um, I always meant to read it because it really spoke to my story directly. I have a lot of scars on my body, and Lucy Greeley wrote a whole book about what it was like for her to live with a facial disfigurement, and uh, um, what it's like, she sort of reflected a lot on this in depth, not just to sort of describe the events that happened to her, but also what it's actually, how it actually changes psychologically. And that's something that always interested me because of my scars, but I kind of never got around to reading it properly. And then um, about uh, how many years now, uh, probably four years ago, when I started seriously writing my latest memoir, Imperfect, which is all the story of my scars, of course, uh, this book was the first book I was thinking about to go and read finally, and I did. And uh, I fell in love with this book. The reason I decided to talk about it today is not because it's, it's, I mean, of course, it matters to me personally how much it spoke to me, to my story, and how many messages there I got that really were really helpful for me. But I also really fell in love with this book because I just think it's a creatively beautiful, beautiful work. It's very, um, reflective so there's so many memoirs around which you just treat it's like a chain of events I did this then I did that then something happened to me and then I reacted whereas this book really goes in depth uh, in what it's like to be a human generally not just a person with a disfigurement plus um, it's also really the language is really beautiful Lucy Greeley initially started her writing life as a poet and it really shows in this book it's lovely, yeah, yeah. Now I'll open up to the audience to see, do we have any questions for Lee about Imperfect, pardon me, sorry, about uh, Autobiography of Faith? I'm getting my book. No, no. Well, yeah, they may emerge that I quote a lot from Autobiography of the Faith in Imperfect, yeah. sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely happy to come back and we can talk about maybe some potential crossovers as well. Uh, but before that, we'll open up to the audience for any questions or comments, reflections about the book. I'll jump in. Um, 
Like when I was I'm in the middle of reading this, I haven't finished it. And one of the things that struck me was that there is a, you know, it is a memoir, but also I think like Imperfect, there's a, a sort of burning question in there, which is about how do I define like myself and this sort of sense of the boundaries of inside and outside and where where the self is constructed and what the self is. And I was just thinking that these are, um, when I was uh, doing research for my PhD, which started looking at women in mythology and ended up looking at the question of what is a woman and recognising that that's actually a philosophical and a spiritual question the deeper you go into it. Um, yeah, and I just, it, it just struck me that, this is like another channel into that question. And I just wondered what you thought about that. I think it's a really deep observation. And Lucy Greeley, especially actually in the second part, it's interesting what you got to middle and you already sensed this because the second part of the book is really goes deeply into this connection between the internal sense of self and the external appearance. Uh, because what is what separates us most definitely from the outside world is our skin, really, it's our body. But with Lucy Greeley, uh, the questions of the question of self was always a burning question, a question that really wrecked her life in many ways. Because um, one of the striking things in the narrative of the book is the story of many, many, many uh, um, plastic surgeries. So, so okay, I might just sort of backtrack very quickly and say that um, Lucy Greeley got her facial disfigurement as a result of uh, getting sick as a child. She had uh, cancer of the jaw. And um, she got the treatment for this. She um, recovered really well, but she was left with a uh, missing part of her face, a missing part of jaw. And so as she grew up, she, incre she increasingly did more and more and more plastic surgery to try and fix um, that, is, is, uh, not fix, but like cover that gap. So to sort of go back to her original structure of her face, but the surgeries com um, continuously failed. Not only they, and so she looked differently all the time, but not only did the surgeries fail, but a lot of the treatments uh, at that time were to do with sort of, um, I think I'm not very good with technical terms, but the, it was about to sort of try and grow more flesh on her face, but her body reabsorbed the flesh. And so what would happen to Lucy is that she would end up the surgery, she would have her bandaged face, she would look at herself in the mirror and she would see herself with bandages. Eventually the bandages will come off and her face might be swollen or it might be quite actually normal size. And then slowly, the, the, unfortunately the, the new flesh will be reabsorbed into her body and the shape will change again. And so as a result, what happened is that she would look at the mirror and she would every time see a stranger and she writes really beautifully about that sense of alienation that came with her all the time, constantly changing uh, face so she kind of lost a bit sense of herself of who she was and she always had this fantasy that if uh, one day her face was uh, uh, you know fixed or whatever language you want to use for this uh, then she would know who she was but it just couldn't happen until eventually after I don't know how many surgeries the book by the way ends when she's 28 but her story continues later we don't know but she at the end of the book but she continued then later to do surgeries but failed again and again but at the end of the book she ends it at the point where she decides no more surgeries a decision she would later rectify but um and then she able finally to look in the mirror and say well it's not the face that I thought I was supposed to have have, if I did not have all these surgeries. So I better start making friends with this person I see in the mirror. But there's another thing about selfhood, and this is something that really I took from her book and really became important topic to me in writing as well, is how we often talk about accepting yourself, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, but really um, our sense of self is very much shaped by interactions we have with environment. And if you're not a monk living at some, you know, edge of a mountain in complete isolation for whatever reasons, it's very hard to see yourself completely objectively or you always, or completely subjectively, in fact, I should say, you all, I think the way we see ourselves is always a work in progress, is as strong as we are. And for somebody like Lucy, who always stood out in the crowds, 
who was constantly, constantly uh, taunted by strangers and not strangers as well. A woman whose, whose life soundtrack was, um, you are different, you are not like us, you are ugly, you are a dog, like really, really horrible, horrible things that she heard day after day. It's very hard also for yourself, sense of self not to be influenced for this. And so a very big part of herself, and she, and she discusses it so intelligently and it's so sad, but it's all also wise and beautiful. She discusses this, uh, how hard it is to, to try and build yourself in your own image. It sounds like it should be easy, but it's actually not at all because you have all those sort of external forces coming into you so once again it's this dissonance inside who am i am i the person who is reflected to me back from the eyes of others am i the person who is reflecting uh, now through the mirror but yesterday i stuck the mirror saw somebody else completely wow yeah that's such an insightful i suppose um contrast of continuity i suppose we we often think about i suppose people changing and evolving over time but I suppose in some way seeing your face in the mirror and having recognition of that face in the mirror can be quite symbolic and I have a quote here from Lucy Greeley uh, that she's been quoted as saying that beauty is a label which can sometimes stand in for other attributes we might I suppose desire to be connected with so uh, you might be saying you want to be beautiful but actually you might want to be respected or loved Did, was that something that you found coming through in the narrative of the book absolutely absolutely and she does she she really sort of looks at this uh, relationship between beauty and what beauty can bring us in a really interesting way so on one hand she in a kind of, she looks at, she kind of shows the paradox that really spoke to me personally. That was another reason why I so related to this book because she talks about how beauty, we associate uh, lots of rewards with beauty, love, as you're saying, Emily, respect, uh, uh, even money, she doesn't talk about this, but often, you know, how we think, oh, if somebody's beautiful, you know, they can get a lot of money, can marry somebody rich, or they can go have a great modeling career or something. So we sort of associate a lot of things with beauty. And when we don't get them, uh, it's very easy to uh, use our appearance and as a kind of scapegoat and say, well, I didn't get it because I'm not beautiful enough, but if I'll do another plastic surgery, or if I'll uh, do Botox, uh, maybe I will get it. So there's this side of that. But on the other hand, and Lucy really talks about this in her book as well, there's also the, 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 the side of, the, the, in fact, beauty does sometimes, unfortunately, bring these rewards. I mean, you're not going to be um, lovable only because you're beautiful. But if you're somebody who stands out the way Lucy did uh, to the extent that men would taunt her in the street and sort of groups of men, especially would sort of say to her horrible things and, and, and you know, and, and stuff like this, you, it's very easy to start feeling that you are unlovable. So it's not like what it, so what, what happened actually to Lucy, and this is something I know not from um, her memoir, but from a memoir companion, which I wanted to show. Uh, so this is a book called Truth and Beauty, and I can talk about the title later if you would like me to, because it's a really interesting story. It's a, well, it's a short but interesting story, but anyway, it's written by, by um, uh, Lucy, one of Lucy's closest friends, a uh, very fair and well-known American writer, Anne Patchett, fantastic writer herself. And Anne Patchett sort of tells the story of Lucy. She picks up the story roughly where the memoir leaves it, a little bit earlier, perhaps. And she, the story continues until Lucy's premature death because she died at, at the age of, I think, 37 or 38. Um, and nobody is sure whether it was a suicide or overdose. So she, she took drugs and, um, and, you know, passed away very young. But uh, um, so, so Anne Patch, and now I lost my track for a sec. <laughs> track of thought for a second, but... Um, oh, yes, yes, the, lo the being lovable. Yes, sorry, sorry. Yes, of course. Um, and so in this, in, so in this uh, memoir, Truth and Beauty, uh, Anne shows how towards the end of her life, uh, which wasn't, which was still very young, you know, mid 
thirties, she finally got lucky, happy in love because she was unhappy for many, many years. She really, really had big difficulties with relationships. Men rejected her all the time in very bad ways. And you can also say it wasn't all based on appearance because Lucy also picked some, you know, not great men, but of course she was driven by insecurity. So it's, it's a very sort of tangled web of reasons and, and circumstances. But anyway, at the end, Lucy experienced happy relationship towards the end of her life. But she couldn't tolerate it for very long because she was, she, and Anne Patchett really described it beautifully. She got so used to being unlovable, to feeling she's unlovable, that for her to feel that somebody suddenly loves her wholly and completely was too disorienting. It's a bit like, you know, Woody Allen once said, but he would never want to be a member in a club, but they would like give him a membership. So it was something like that, which is very, very sad, of course. So, so Luce, both Lucy and, and Anne in their memoirs are very honest about how, although beauty doesn't automatically bring us the rewards we expect of it to, to, to bring, but when your appearance is really deviates from the norm, um, it, it can happen this way, which is sort of not getting these things because of how inside you get messed up and, and believe all the social messages that you're just not you know good enough or whatever it is and you just stop trying yeah yeah now earlier you mentioned that one thing you really enjoyed about this memoir was that it wasn't just a blow by blow recount that you really engaged with the structure of the writing was there any aspects which you feel might have influenced your uh, your own writing at all? Yeah, sure. Um, the, stru the, the structure and the language of memoirs probably not so much, not, not because I don't love it, but just because when I came to read her memoir finally, I've already thought a lot about memoir and, and taught it a lot. So there were things that, that I could, but are very much evident there which I already knew, such as, for example, one of the biggest things probably, it's it's something that we as um, Pritchett once said. He said, uh, you don't get any credit for lived experience. You get credit for what you make out of it. So, and, and her memoir really showcases it. So I guess what he was meaning is that if you, you need to be a really good storyteller, if you, it doesn't matter what you've done in your life, you could have survived in a jungle, you know, for 10 days with tigers around you or whatever. If you can't tell a story well, it's not going to be interesting, even if very interesting things happen to you. But if you're a good writer, you will take, you can just tell about your breakfast that you just had and it will be so interesting. And that's what Lucy Greeley is really good at doing. Uh, she can tell us a very, uh, very simple, very short story of just going to shops. And the story will show complex themes of her relationship to her body, of how people relate to her, of all sorts of just generally uh so she, lots of the, just the culture that she is in it will be almost like a mirror to her society just very little short visit to a shop and i think it's wonderful but what i did take from lucy is a lot of i guess uh, i mean i can talk and talk about it and we don't have much time so i just want to say one thing that i really took for her memoir that influenced my work um I just, I was, was really thrilled to find affirmation of something I felt for a long time in her book. So I often, I hardly ever, for years and years, I hardly ever disclosed my scars, uh, even to my close friends, even though I have lots of them. So that's how secretive I was about them. Because, and one of the reasons that I was so secretive, apart from feeling shame as if it was something wrong I committed stupidly of course but you know things that that's how we sort of women raise to to feel responsible for our bodies but anyway but when I did raise the question of my scars very occasionally the responses I often got which were, were really well-meaning lovely responses but they were not helpful but something like look there are people worse off than you and you know you at least the scars are on your legs and or your torso they're not on your face or you know, beauty is not everything, you know, so I got all these sort of responses, like, basically, they were, they all melted down to uh, just get over it, things could have been worse, not worth you worrying about, but, but the impact it was really big, and, and in Lucy Greeley's book, she really talks very openly about how important it is to grieve, it's a bit like, because bo bodily issues, they, they, there's a lot of um, commonalities between bodily problems, bodily issues, and um, generally sense of loss and grief. It's like you, and you can, it's kind of like you lose the body you could have had. And uh, 
every beginning counselor knows, and every, I think, lay person these days knows that if somebody loses something really important to them, the last thing they need to hear is get over it. <laughs> it doesn't work like this. So I'll just read you a very little quote, if I may. Is that okay, Emily? Great, from thank you. Yeah. About the importance of grieving to actually feel better about your body. And uh, so, um, one second, just try to do it quickly. My inner life became even more macabre. Vietnam was still within recent memory and pictures of the horrors of Cambodia loomed on every TV screen and in every newspaper. I told myself again and again how good I had it in comparison with a wonder, uh, sorry, how good I had it in comparison. What a wonder it was to have food and clothes and a home and no one torturing me. But then she said, I had the capacity of imagination to momentarily escape my own pain. And I had the elegance of imagination to teach myself something true regarding the world around me. But I didn't yet have the clarity of imagination to grant myself the complicated and necessary right to suffer. I treated despair in terms of hierarchy. If there was a more important pain in the world, it meant my own was negated. I thought I simply had to accept the fact that I was ugly and that to feel despair about it was simply wrong. So it re this really spoke to me because I always felt that, uh, I mean, I, I always felt that for some, but it, it's really individual. For some people, positive psychology can really help work. But for somebody like me, and I suppose for Lucy as well, based on her memoir, we need first to, to grieve before we get can get anything out of our system. If, if anything can ever, you know, completely get out of the system. I don't know. That's my Russian tragic world view too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, really interesting opposing psychologies. One saying, you know, you need to, you know, take a break from this. You need to kind of move on. But I suppose going through that process of grief, yeah, it allows you to process. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Now, and also I think... Um, I think some. I think it's very good the idea of sort of thinking about things positively and and uh, you know etc cetera, etc. Cetera. But I think we at the moment as a culture as a society taking it a bit too extreme where it becomes imperative. And when I was interviewing um, people for my book for Imperfect, this is something I heard from a lot of people who would say something like, "Well, already I have something and I'm grieving about, but I'm also now grieving about feeling that I'm not allowed to be grieving." So it's like it's like a double sort of you know. Yeah, yeah. I suppose observing yourself and having judgments about your own judgment. Yes, exactly right. Yeah. Exactly right. Yeah. 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 I'd like to open up again to our audience if we have any questions. Did I see a hand up there? Oh, I'm, I wouldn't mind um, jumping in as well. Hi, Lee. Um, always Hi. amazing to hear you talk about these topics because I think, I mean, it's such a fraught, I guess, like landscape whenever we talk about women and women in particular and beauty and um I don't know you've written and and spoken quite widely about yeah about this um I was just going to say so in memoir what what I'm kind of really interested to hear about is is less about the beauty side of it but I think more about the trauma or the, the pain side because I think both both with some of your writing and with this book by um Lu by Lucy Greeley is this you know this sort of pain that's associated with with these experiences and 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 how that you know the ramifications of that as that goes on did you sort of identify with that in this auto in in her memoirs um is that something that you know affected you when you were reading it do you mean the pain dash yeah like the pain yeah. like i guess the the physical pain i mean the emotional pain of I, you know i think is really clear in there but i think just um the physical pain yes absolutely yeah. absolutely so the first but particularly the first part of the memoir that uh, you read sarah <laughs> um it's uh it's really a lot about lucy in the hospitals and I spent my childhood in hospitals too, as Dash knows. Uh, I know you're yeah, imperfect. Uh, because I was born with um, um, defect in my, in my heart. And also I had uh, a rot trauma as a child. And so I had lots of surgeries and lot, long hospitalizations. And so the physical pain descriptions really spoke to me, of course. Um, but also what was interesting to me is how was how Lucy describes the microcosm of a hospital. Because I, I could so identify with her once again, because the common wisdom is it's better to be in a hospital 
hospitals are tough places, especially for a child. It's really hard places to be in, et cetera, et cetera. It's lonely places. And it's all true in a way, but there's the other side of it. And Lucy describes amazingly how for her hospitals were often refuge because outside people taunted her. She was bullied. She, was, she, stood, she stood out as being different. Inside the hospital, everybody was battered. Everybody had some problems. It was like, almost like a safe place there among people who understood her and knew where she was coming from. And, and, and one of the really wonderful things about this memoir also, Dash, is um, how well she writes tragic comedy. I really relate to this sensibility. So even though she describes really tough stuff, you, you can't help but smile at this too. Like she sees all this sort of funny sides to, to all that suffering too. So for example, there's a great... Uh, except there when she when a, a new girl arrives at the hospital and she got really horribly uh, injured she had her guts falling out I don't know something really bad happened to her some boats and Lucy's furious at her and she's intensely jealous because she gets all the attention whereas until she arrived in the hospital she was the star because she had the most surgeries she was the most sort of wounded person there and she so so I just um there were so many moments like this where I just thought yes Lucy you just nailed it how it is she, she's very unsentimental you know she's really sort of tells you how how things are which I just love um I've got a question which sort of relates to that and it's actually just harking back to um Anne Patchett's Truth and Beauty which I haven't read but um when I was looking at some of the stuff about Lucy I stumbled on a letter that her sister had written about Truth and Beauty and her sister was very angry and upset by the depiction of her in it and um was, was feeling like Anne Pratchett had uh, sort of manipulated the family and they didn't like the depiction of Lucy in it and and um, the sister actually called her a grief thief which was you know quite um, quite a you know full-on thing to say and I just wondered since you have read both of them and looked at the relationship between them um, yeah what you thought. That's what a great question I read it later because I was obsessed for a while with these two oh, yeah. ones. Yeah, so I'm very, yeah. <laughs> it's very, very interesting because if you read uh, Lucy Greer's memoir, one of the recurring motives in this book is how her family did not support her enough mm. during anything of that. So if, if there's a damning memoir there of the family, I would say out of the two, it's definitely, definitely going to be autobiography of her face. And this is really, that was also something that was really interesting to me to see how much the role of the family exacerbated Lucy's story. And sometimes I was tempted to imagine what would have been life for her like if her family understood her better, if there were more for her. There were some absolutely heart-wrenching moments there. So as you can see, I don't like the sister. <laughs> there's, <laughs> there's some, there's some, and I love Anne Patchett. Anyway, but there's, <laughs> there are some really heart-wrenching moments in the book where Lucy, a child, maybe nine, maybe 10, maybe 12, goes into chemotherapy, goes into all these treatments alone. Look, I'm a mother to two children. I was just crying when I was reading it. I just could not. And look, I was a child, you know, as a child in a hospital, and I, I could not imagine what it would have been like for a 10, 11, 12 year old girl to be left alone doing chemotherapy. And that's how she, so I don't care about what your sister says. Whereas when, when she was an adult, uh, Anna Patchett became her family. Basically Lucy, one of the amazing things about her, and this is what Truth and Beauty shows really wonderfully. Truth and Beauty really rounds uh, Lucy Greeley's portrait um, by showing a lot of her sides that are not related to her, to her facial disfigurement. I think she really creates a very rounded uh, portrait of, of uh, Lucy Greeley. And uh, one of the things that this memoir of Anne Patchett highlights is how friendships were the lifeblood of Lucy, how, they, how she found her own family because her initial family just did not work for her. And so she was a very resourceful woman, Lucy Greeley, uh, even though sort of she likes to protect herself sometimes in very dark colors, but she was amazing and people loved her, people gravitated towards her. And Anne Patchett was there for her often like a sister. And I think that probably, she actually in the memoir in Truth of Beauty, there's very little she would say about Lucy's family and maybe that what was uh, the sister I like. And that's what I thought when I read that letter <laughs> because who really, who, the people who really supported her was not, was not happy. Judging by these two books was not the sister. 
Yeah, yeah, so it's very, quite a passionately worded letter for someone who is absent, I suppose, at least in Lucy's account of, um, of her life. And I suppose it's also really interesting to, we've been talking about how you define your identity in, uh, in proximity to others and to your relationships. And so it's very interesting also to have that kind of external focus from Ann Patchett as well to, as you say, round out the picture. Yeah. And yeah. I just want to quickly say that it's amazing, like when you read Truth and Beauty, and, and some of it is actually not Ann Patchett's word. There's quite a lot of quotes from Lucy's letters to her. Their relationship, I reckon, was so passionate, even though it was completely platonic. It was so passionate. It was like, it was like reading about love affair. Mm-hmm. Now we are just on about 7.30. Uh, do we have a last question? Yes, of course. Oh, great. I appreciate Hi, it. Hi, um, I haven't read, I, I, I came on here just to find out whether I would like to read the book because I've read the reviews and uh, why would I be interested in that? I'm really happy that you spoke about grief. Um, I, as a woman of colour, I know the, the struggles of uh, women of colour in, you know, an, uh, a mainly... Uh, white mainstream society is the the idea of beauty is often unreachable that there is what we reach for is acceptance um, and so I guess when I heard you talking I uh, I heard this dichotomy or dualism of uh, ugly and and beauty and I'm wondering you know, because hers so much sounds like a survival story and how much is it just that she's struggling to be accepted? So I just wanted to ask you to talk about that. Yeah, Pearl, that's a, that's a great point, of course. And actually, uh, in my book too, I sort of talk a lot about the difference between beauty and what we call normal. So yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. So I don't think Lucy was unrealistic at all. She was really what she wanted is to be able to walk uh, out of her house and not to draw attention. Because yeah, it, as you know, as you would say, like when, you, when our parents stand out in whatever way it is, it's really hard. It's like you, you're just walking and you, you have all this gaze on you and she sometimes felt like a real spectacle. And, and there's a very beautiful passage in her book. I think I can find it. It's very short, I promise. <laughs> but I think it's talking exactly about what you just um, raised, Pearl. Um, um, ah, yes, here, here it is. So she talks about being in the hospital and looking at and, and being sort of near patients. So she, because she did a lot of reconstructive plastic surgeries, but she wasn't doing like to change her nose or something like this. She was actually just wanting to get her original face back, but she looked, she compared herself a lot to plastic surgery people. And so this is what she's saying. So other patients sort of around her who just have a nose, they want to change or whatever it is. So she says, the people in the plastic surgery world hated their gorgeously hooked noses, their wise lines, their exquisitely thin lips. Beauty, as defined by society at large, seemed to be only about who was best at looking like everyone else. If I had my original face, an undamaged face, I would know how to appreciate it, know how to see the beauty of it. So she really, she, she's sort of a little bit ironic about it, but I think that she means it, Pearl, that she, in that she's saying she, what she wanted to do, she just wanted to come back to her, uh, to how she was before the surgery. So that when she walks on, uh, on the street, she wouldn't have to do what she often did, which was, she often like would sort of put her, cover her face with the, the hair like this, or put like really scarves up to here, just because she didn't want to be called a dog or like, like this is the, the see how seriously people would really haunt her or, you know, especially drunken groups of men or. Yeah, thank you. I, I relate with her. Um, yeah, it's really interesting. Um, yeah, I think women of color who 
when they look at themselves in the mirror, they do get a shock because they're their imaginings of who they are when they when we move in society which doesn't reflect back to us who we are we yeah we be, we develop another persona absolutely look, look in the mirror it's a shock so i can relate to those shades that you're talking about so definitely absolutely we, I think we are really, as you really uh, very wisely said, it's, it's really a book about what it's like to be different. It's a, bo a book about dealing with, with difference on a daily basis. A difference that you cannot cover when you want to because it's mm. there. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. I appreciate your response. Yeah, I th yeah it's really insightful, I suppose, to be thinking about the difference between uh, beauty and I suppose limiting beauty is a homogenous uh, ideal and, and thinking about, you know, there's so many different um, kind of perspectives. Yeah, yeah. So it's about 7.35 now, so we will have to wrap up. But yeah, these are all very so interesting ideas we could talk about for so long. Um, so just to let you know a bit more about the upcoming schedule for the Heroines Book Month. Our next uh, live author event will be next Saturday, the 14th of November. We have Bem LaHunt talking about her chosen book, A Room of One's Own by Virginia Woolf. That will be seven o'clock to 7.30. And then of course, tomorrow we have a, uh, an author workshop by Lauren Elise Daniels. She is conducting the Writing Rebel Heroines workshop from 11 o'clock to 11, pardon me, to uh, 1.15. So this is a separately ticketed event. You can find out a bit more on our website. We'd love for you to all continue to this, the discussion over on our Circle SM message boards. You can also find uh, extra videos from the authors as well as the rest of our full program. So thank you everyone for coming and for your insightful questions and comments about, uh, about the novel and about, I suppose, deeper philosophical concepts as well. So thank you everyone for joining us. And yes. Emily and Sarah, thank you so much for hosting. And Dash and yes. I'm happy to see you. <laughs> so Bye. wonderful um, to see you on it. Yeah, the, I mean, the book sounds amazing. And I've, so I've seen, I've read excerpts of it, but thank you, Lee, for bringing it to this whole new level now. So yeah, it's amazing. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye, um, Bye. Bye everyone. <laughs>